Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, 22X Assays Revolutionalized and Still Turning, Duraclone Dry Regions for Flow Cytometry. I am Antonina Salcido of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Beckman Culture Life Sciences. To learn more, please visit Beckman.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Michael Kapinski, Senior Marketing Manager at Beckman Culture Life Sciences. Michael, you may now begin your presentation. Yeah, hello everybody. Thanks for the kind introduction. My name is Michael Kapinski. I'm with Beckman Kuta Life Sciences as a product manager, specifically for the Dura clone and directive kits. So obviously this is what I would like to talk about today. However, I don't want to make it a marketing message, just marketing pitch. Today, the idea is really just to showcase all the different areas of research where these kits can be very efficiently applied. So I really would like to let research work and published results speak for the kits rather than pitching my marketing messages today. Okay, so let's start. Next slide is just obligatory. Mandatory slide. We can quickly skip that. Yeah, before I go into all these examples of Duraclone supported research in immune oncology, infection and immunity, and in immune modulation, I would like to take a step back first and talk about the origins of this concept, which is the one study a large international study that developed a very efficient, very robust way of standardizing flow cytometry together with beckman coulter And finally, at the end of this presentation, I would go like to go a little bit beyond just the examples, being a little bit more general again, and try to put a spotlight a little bit what it means to data analysis if you have the luxury to work with really highly standardized flow cytometry assays. And finally, of course, there will be a wrap up and some time for questions and answers. Well, let's get into the one study first. <clears throat> I would like to pick up a statement here in the beginning from Francis S. Collins, who was directing the NIH from 2009 to 2021 and really puts an emphasis here on the importance of reproducibility. So when a result can be reproduced by multiple scientists, it validates the original results and the readiness to progress to the next phase of research, to ask the next question. Um, in order to really value this sentence, it might make sense to invert it and to think about what would happen to results that cannot be reproduced by multiple sciences, that fail to be reproduced. Uh, you may ask yourself, would this be the results that would be the basis of asking the next question? Would this be really impactful results? So probably not. I think the importance of reproducibility of results cannot be overemphasized. And basically this ties back to the level of robustness and standardization that you apply when doing your research, when designing your essays and your, your experimental setup. The one study consortium, which consists of the entities, as we see on the lower left, uh, was very well aware of the importance of standardization and they took this as a real central prerequisite for the success of their study intentions, of their idea that they wanted to study uh, in this international setting, which was to induce tolerance via uh, cellular agents in kidney recipients 
using a variety of different uh, living drugs uh, to do this, but just one unitized way of analyzing the results. So they stated in their paper, method paper from 2013, that to be able to compare the effectiveness and of alternative cellular therapeutics, the standardization of immune monitoring assays is critical. So they absolutely recognized that these results between the different cellular approaches could only be compared if the immune monitoring assays would be very well standardized. And therefore, the one study consortium developed together with us, Beckman Kuta Life Sciences, a very robust immune monitoring procedure that is laid down in this paper that you see here on the left, which is today recognized as a golden reference standard in multi-site standardization for flow cytometry, where Beckman Kuta proudly provided the whole flow cytometry solution to this eight center study. However, not only the methods were uh, published and gained a lot of attention, but also the results, of course, which is finally the import more important objective. The results from this uh, one study were published in a very high impact paper in the Lancet. And of course, this is the result of standardization also across all centers, not only including flow cytometry, all the other methods, of course, but thus, these results could really get the impact that they deserve as they now can be the basis for asking further questions, for asking the next questions due to using very highly standardized methods. On our side at Beckman Coulter, the aftermath of the standardization efforts at the one study were to convert liquid cocktails where you can, of course, apply a certain level of standardization into something that would be even much more robust and unbreakable, which are dry formats that run under the brand of Dura Innovation Dry Unitized Reagent Assays at Beckman Coulter. So this is related to a specific technology to dry down multicolor antibody mixes and also dry stimulation mixes into a layer, into a bottom, as you see on the upper right. So that's not a lyophilization technology. And this layer would be firmly attached to the assay container. And just by adding your sample, you would dissolve the layer and you would basically be back in the world of very conventional flow cytometry, now following up the standard protocols to process the sample. So with this technology, we have developed 22 catalog products that run under the brand of DuraClone. These are, as you see, ready to use products, antibody panels, stimulation mixes, where we have made sure that they are not only compatible with pre-enriched cell suspensions, such as PBMCs, but also compatible with whole blood. So really the native materials. Um, we made sure that the protocols are streamlined so that they do not only eliminate antibody pipetting, but would also spare wash steps wherever possible, um, find smart configurations to get away from the need to compensate the spillover between uh, the different dye emissions. So really thinking very holistic about it to make it very simple and easy to manage also for non-experts. That is all part of this design for multi-institutional studies, for studies that go over long time, longitudinal settings, where operators change. And um, basically you really make, have to make sure that the possibility for an operator to do different than another one is minimized. And <clears throat> within this DuraClone program, we have five families, as you see on the left, IM for immune system research, IF for immune functional assays, that to be seen together with Directive, which is dry stimulation mixes for immune activation. Then we have a series called Duraclone RE for rare event detection, looking into very small populations um, in front of a background of a huge number of normal cells to find those small population that is abnormal. And then Duraclone stem cell SC for adult stem cell research.
I already mentioned that the Dura clone kits and directive kits have been tested also to work with whole blood. So why did I emphasize this so much? Um, there's a good portion in the scientific community that thinks if you do not decompose the sample by PBMC isolation, do not wash away all the soluble components that are imported in cellular interaction, you might end up with a situation that is much closer to the physiological situation than you would see with PBMCs. And so we took the step like the one study and make sure that all these assays are applicable with whole blood samples. And this also includes, which is often a reason for not going with whole blood, this also includes cryopreserved samples where now whole blood freezing methods are out there. And here in this paper that I'm showing here on the screen, it was demonstrated that a whole range of different Dura clones was tested with whole blood or frozen whole blood samples and could show very, very similar results to the native materials. So here we have compatibility with native whole blood as well as with cryopreserved whole blood. Once again, I would like to make the case for standardization, the importance of standardization of flow cytometry to really generate impactful clinical research impactful research results. So if you can rely on a very well standardized assay to assess potentially rel relevant immune parameters, you might be able to find a correlation, a correspondence between certain immune signatures and the efficacy of a certain treatment or side effects that are associated with this treatment. Um, giving you the possibility to articulate a hypothesis to predict the outcome of a certain treatment, to predict the uh, chance of success with such a treatment. On the other side, you might also get into the situation that you can hypothesize um, or can articulate a hypothesis, a hypothesis to prevent side effects, which in turn then could be verified by adding new data sets from the same standardized method so that your correlationship between these things that you are speculating here can be really proven. And that is what impactful clinical research is about, that you end up with something that can be really applied and that could lead to clinical development, development of diagnostic, personalized treatments. Let's go to some proof points now. As said already, I don't want to spend a lot of time today to talk about the uh, values and features of Dura clone. I want rather to let research speak how this can be used very efficiently and how um, <clears throat> supportive this can be of your research. The first example out of immuno-oncology I would like to showcase here is <clears throat> from this group around James Hutchinson, who demonstrated that by analyzing the T cell compartment, they can identify a certain signature that would, predict, would be predictive for the development of inflammatory side effects in dual checkpoint therapy. On the upper left, we may see that inflammatory side effects in dual checkpoint therapy are not rare. So three, around 70% of all patients treated with dual checkpoint therapy would develop so, such uh, complications. This might be a single complication only, but we also see that this might be more severe with a combination of several complications, several inflammatory side effects. So it's a very relevant question to understand how we could basically um, predict if a patient under treatment has a high likelihood to develop such complications or not. And using the IMT cell subset tube, among some other tubes, um, Hutchinson and colleagues were able to identify that a certain subpopulation of the CD4 positive T helper 
cell compartment or the proportion of this subpopulation could be uh, a predictor of the development of hepatitis in dual checkpoint therapy. And here's some more detail to that. Um, they especially observed that this hepatitis or hepatitis as a side effect would occur more often in autumn and winter time. So in a time when uh, the patient would be more prone to viral infections. And taking it from there, they found that the predictive power of the proportion of the effect to memory CD4 T cell subset um, was much more stronger if they would look into patients with a reactivated CMV infection only, as you see here in this red box. And um, <clears throat> the difference between looking at all uh, patients and only the CMV positive patients can also be seen by the areas under the curve where the red area under the curve is much larger and represents only the CMV positive cases. So if they would combine the information about CMV reactivation and the information obtained from the INT cell subset tube, um, which is the proportions in the, the proportions in the CD4 T cell compartment, they could come up to a situation that is depicted on the upper right, where at a, <clears throat> with a threshold of 16%, um, of effective memory cells in the CD4 compartment, they could decide whether a patient would have a high risk to develop hepatitis or not. Um, I think that's, that's a very impressive finding regarding the fact that you don't need any further clinical data to, to do this uh, decision, just the CMV reactivation and the T-cell subset compartment, so just immunological data would put you in, into a position to do such a, such a strong prediction here. Let's go to the next case, CAR T-cells. I think CAR T-cells are all around. Everybody has heard of it. It's basically on the, the speaker list of any, uh, any uh, flow cytometry-related meeting that you have. CAR T cells will be on there. And here I would like to present a paper that looks at CAR T cells as they are produced, so CAR T cell products, but also about on the fate of CAR T cells post infusion. So, what happens to those CAR T cells once they are back into the patient? And for these purposes, the group developed immune monitoring antibody panels. Um, to monitor CAR T cells. <clears throat> and here's how the group sees the application of dry reagents uh, or the benefit of dry reagents for their specific research purpose. So on the left, you would see the typical situation of single color antibodies. Normally you would um, cocktail from those to do your, your assays with all the possibilities to introduce error and variability and contaminations. However, um, we as a high quality manufacturer can take also these antibodies and formulate the Dura clone or custom dry formulations unitized already in this uh, sample vial. Um, now they would be room temperature stable, so very easy logistics and storage. Um, while this is a highly standardized solution, still you would have the flexibility to add antibodies to adapt this to your specific research question. And then there you are, you would add the patient sample and would just follow a standard flow cytometry protocol. So very classical. However, all these things associated with this bulk of single color antibodies on the left, all these error prone procedures, these potential prepping errors, all this would be taken away because you can rely on the dry formulation of the cocktail already. And here's an excerpt of what was done in this study. You see there are some lines that have blue cells. These blue cells represent the constituents of a catalog Dura clone tube. So something that you simply could order like a single antibody. And the cells, uh, the lines with the green cells, these would represent dry formulations custom made for 
this purpose here. You see there are yellow cells in all the lines. Yellow cells would represent the drop-ins that were used in order to adapt the framework that was there already either by catalog or custom to a specific research question. A specific drop-in I would like to highlight here in the red frame, that is the CAR-CD19. Um, so into this framework of custom or dry Dura clone, you could put your probe of question. So this could be a probe that recognizes CAR-CD19 expression the on the target cells, or it uh, could also be a BCMA car. So any car would basically be able to be, any car probe would basically be able to be dropped in here into this highly standardized framework, um, giving you a very universal tool to do this kind of studies. And this is just example how this might look like. You see here we have an overlay of three different types of T cells, so some healthy control, car negative T cells, as represented by the black line, and then the yellowish curve uh, stands for the patient T cells that do not express the car, while the green curve are the respective ones that express the car. And you might see the differences here. Let's take CD57. So the late terminally differentiated fraction of T cells is much higher in the non-CAR modified cells. However, on the other side, checkpoint inhibition molecules such as LAG3, such as TIM3, PD1, CD155, and TICKET, they are all higher expressed in these T cells in the patient that are also CAR positive. Of course, just from assessing this, uh, we cannot conclude on and the reason behind this and maybe the effects that may, or may arise from that. But I think it's an important finding to finally understand what makes a CAR T cell a good one, a persisting one, a very effective one, as opposed to a CAR T cell that might vanish very quickly, that might not have the high proliferative uh, potential and maybe not of great value for the therapeutic success. Third case here in immuno-oncology is a very special one because here we are using the Dura clones that have been designed for <coughs> immune studies in human now in mouse models. And uh, these are preclinical humanized mouse models. So these mouse, uh, in these mouse models, we have a transplantation of a human hepatopoietic system that we can look at, we can study this human hematopoietic system, for instance, in cancer mouse models. And this is how it looks like. Um, basically, we are gating the cells on the upper left. And in the third plot from the left, we see that there are two larger populations on each axis, single positive. So here on the y-axis, we see the population that stains positive for a mouse leukocyte marker. So here we basically dump remove all remaining mouse leukocytes, while on the lower right of this plot, on the x-axis, we see a large population that stains positive for the CD45 that is contained in the Dura clone, I am phenotype basic that we see on the right. And then all the other contained markers that are dried into this tube can just be analyzed very classically. So we see the monocytes with CD14, the NK cells with CD56, the T cells with CD3, the B cells with CD19. You see CD4 and CD8 positive T cells. So just very much the same way as we would do in a human blood sample. I think this is really a stunning, uh, stunning use of the dry uh, Dura clone tubes here. And I'm going to continue over the next slide just to showcase this example. So here we see this for B cells, where we can find all kinds of different B cells just by applying this dry tube. So very easy. Um, I am B cell, another marker that would be used to counter stain uh, any mouse leukocytes. And there you are, you could do your very classical analysis on the human hematopoietic system in the mouse by using a highly standardized product. Same here for TCRs, identify alpha, beta, and gamma, delta subsets. And within the gamma, delta T cells, we'll see the VD1 and VD2, um, all by this ready-to-use tube just at the mouse sample. 
add one marker to basically exclude the mouse leukocytes, mouse cells from, from analysis. And here you are. And finally, there's a, another example here looking into T-Rex, so also for intranuclear staining of transcription factors in the CD4 T-cells to identify immunosuppressive T-Rex. We can use just a standardized tool and apply the, this to this preclinical human humanized mouse model. Let's go to a different field, infection immunity. Here I would like to show um, functional assessment of myeloid cells or monocytes in sepsis studies, where also a Dura clone and a directive tube is used. And here I would like, similar to what the authors did, like, would like to really focus a little bit on the workflow. So we see that the respective blood sample would be just added to the directive tube that contains LPS and Breffel DNA, so to have toll-like receptor mediated stimulation. We incubate this for two, two and a half hours at 37 degree. Then we apply a fixation, permeabilization stain in the Dura clone tube, and then we are acquiring the data. So along all this process, we have not handled anything else than the sample and maybe some washing buffer or some permeabilization buffer. We have not handled any stimulants. We have not been freezing, thawing, aliquoting those. We have not pipetting any antibodies. And this overall procedure is done in a rough, roughly three hours. So really something that every non-expert can do. It's really plug and play functional analysis of monocytes because as you might see, there's also no wash step needed here in this uh, workflow, and there's no compensation needed due to the selection of rurochromes that we did. So it's really fit for purpose when it comes to multicentric clinical trials where the skill set in the different sites might be very variable. It doesn't matter here, any non expert can handle that. Next example, infection immunity. Obviously, if you talk about this these days, you cannot circumvent COVID. Uh, COVID is uh, very prominent still in immunological research here, in infection immunity research. And here I would like to show a paper that on the one hand showed that neutrophil function or differences in neutrophil function are associated with different causes of disease here, but also other changes or other uh, deviations in the compartments, the immune compartments here, the B cell compartments are associated uh, with the severity of cause of disease here. So with the IM B cell tube that you already have seen in the mouse experiments, uh, which is an eight color tube, a relatively simple tube, we can have a very high resolution analysis of the B cell compartment already as you see on the upper right using the MUMA projections here. Furthermore, we can cluster by this tube, hierarchically cluster all the subpopulations as by the uh, expression density of the markers that you can see here in each column. And we find, or the authors find here in this study, that by doing this, by clustering all these populations in the different cohorts, they can find pretty prominent difference between uh, the memory unswitched B cells in healthy cohorts and the COVID-19 cohort with a moderate to severe cause of the disease. And the same holds true for transitional B cells. So with a simple standardized tool, we can find out this subtle difference in the B cell compartment. And just for completeness, there was also fi a functional finding with the um, tendency of neutrophils to netosis. Yeah, so there's also a functional finding, but also in the B cell compartment, as was enabled by a highly standardized tool again, the B cell tube that has been used in many other studies. And here it, it has this specific purpose. So very versatile use for this type of products. Third example, infection immunity. Here we are looking at the pro-inflammatory T cell functionality, again, in COVID patients. This was done in the context of looking at the effect 
on the T cell functionality by a certain novel therapeutic approach in COVID. And what we can see here with Ellie Spot very nicely is that upon, if you look uh, in, in the left part of the graphs, upon stimulation with CD3, CD28, you would see a strong induction of TNF alpha or interferon gamma or both of them. Whereas in the patient cohort, you see only very little stimulation by CD328 um, with regard to the production of the cytokines or the mixed production of cytokines. However, the Ellie spot here does not give us a real good explanation where this, this, this comes from and which of the T cell populations that have a great variety in their functions is really important here. It's really uh, causative to this difference in cytokine expression. And if we do this by using the AFT activation tube and directive one, we can see that in the lower row, if you look across the different box plots, you hardly see a difference between uh, the left group, which is basically the, the healthy uh, cohort and the, the patients. Um, this row represents the response of CD8 positive cells. But relatively strong difference come out here if by virtue of identifying the T helper cells with the phenotypic gating, if you just look at the T helper cells, and the T helper cells, we see that the triple negative, so the non-responsive CD4 fraction, is much larger in patients than in healthy donors here. And we also see that specifically interferon gamma and interferon gamma TNF alpha IL2 combined production have a strong difference, a strongly pronounced difference if you compare healthy with patients here. So this is only accessible by flow cytometry. Any spot could not deconvolute this difference here in the uh, cytokine response. However, with IFT activation tube and directive one, uh, we have a very swift, uh, immediately available tool just to do this in, in a very highly standardized way. Uh, that could also be done between centers then to, to enlarge, uh, simply enlarge your cohort. Immune regulation. Let's go now to this uh, field of research and specifically to mesenchymal stromal cells. So mesenchymal stromal cells in culture typically are licensed by uh, exposure to pro-inflammatory cytokines to basically increase their potency, to increase their, uh, the um, immunosuppressive effect that they would have. And this group here is now trying to go a different pathway to license the MSCs, not by means of chemical messages, but by a method that they call mechanotransduction. And this mechanotransduction part that we see basically in the middle is nothing else but a device that in a very controlled, defined way would exert shear stress on the MSCs in replacing the, the exposure to inflammatory cytokines. And then in the third part of this uh, setting here, in immunoassays, there would be a checkup um, how, or if the phenotype of the cell has changed and is there any change to functionality also that we can see in comparison to the alternative method of licensing or in comparison to non-licensed cells and so on. That's what they found using the assay mesenchymal tube when it came to the phenotype. On the left, we see several batches um, with negative markers that are compared to a reference batch. And we see that there is no significant difference. Basically, all negative markers stay negative upon this mechanic shear stress. And also the positive markers um, that are used to identify or to uh, verify the, the identity of MSCs stay positive and there's no change in surface receptor expression, which of course is a very important prerequisite to consider this mechanic treatment at all in a culture, in the cell culture process. So <clears throat> we 
can also use this basically in a completely uh, artificial scenario in C2, just as we would be able to use this tool to, for instance, characterize extracts from, from a stromal vascular fraction. Second example for immune regulation, not only myelin cells are important in, um, and, and stromal cells are important in tissue regeneration, but also T cells play a very important role as this paper is showing here. And in this paper, IMT cell subset tube and IMT rec tube were used to determine the ratio between a certain subtype of effector cell and T, a certain uh, um, type of T helper cell, the T regulatory T cells. So by identifying all these subsets in the CD4 and CD8 T cells, it was found that specifically the ratio between these two type of cells is um, yeah, very indicative of the, or is, has a predictive value in, when it comes to the natural bone healing process. So in case there's a certain balance that is shown as the highest line in the red box, we see there's a normal healing process. If the CDA plus T effector cells prevail, we see that there's an impaired healing and this could be pretty dramatic. Um, while if the T regulatory cells prevail, we even see a certain improvement of the healing over the more normal healing process. So this was uh, an example where not only these two populations that are determining here the, the outcome of the process or that are basically predicting this outcome, uh, not only to assess those, but also in the large study, um, basically staining all the T cell subcompartments. Uh, the first step of course was to identify that these populations are important at all before you could uh, basically assess the ratio between them. So both steps of the process were supported here with the highly standardized duraclone tubes. These were the examples. I now would like to add a couple of comments also of a more general nature regarding the results that you would obtain with standardized phenotyping assays, such as the Duraclone assays. Um, what is the impact on data analysis if you rely on this type of, on this quality of data production? The first paper that I would like to relate to here is out of 2018, a Canadian group, Vancouver, found that if they go by Duraclone-based standardization, this would enable them, enable them to create an automated data analysis pipeline um, for data that was obtained from different operators um, along a time course from different sites, from different materials, so PVMCs as well as whole blood, as well as cryopreserved PVMCs, and even different instrument platforms. So they found that oops, um, the power of standardization was the real enabler here, and it, it enabled them to directly compare data from different studies, from different centers and operators, and collect it over different time intervals. So it took out a lot of these batch effects that you typically would observe and would hinder to apply these type of automated uh, analysis platform in, in this versatile way on this diverse uh, set of data. Second, here the approach or the, the task is a little bit different. While in the paper before, the idea was to generate an auto gating that could allow you to identify all the compartmentalization, all the subpopulations um, in a very standardized way and eliminating the interoperator differences as good as possible. Here, the idea was to generate a computational approach that can do does something, can do something that maybe a human operator is not capable to do. Uh, because here we are talking about very, very rare cell populations um, on the canvas of a huge background 
of normal B cells. And this is really, really expert work to find these cells. So the idea to have a computational assistance in doing that is pretty, uh, pretty clear, pretty near. And what this, this means, we see on the left, in the upper row, we have a data example where the red cells, which are the abnormal cells, uh, have been identified by an expert operator. And in the row below on the left, um, <clears throat> we see the same data set and the same color coding applies here. Also the malignant cells are red. And this is done by an automated analysis um, on the data, same data sample as above. And we see that the results are pretty much identical. I think important to say or to mention that the training for this algorithm uh, was done by a data set that had not included the one that we see here analyzed. So this data was acquired with the RE-ALB tube, seven markers, dried, again, unbreakable. You could not forget to pipette a marker or pipette the wrong volume. It's just there. You just have to add the samples. And if you can rely on such a standardized method and then have as a, another strong standardization method, this algorithm that could interpret the, even the data and detect and find the, the right cells for you, then you are in a situation that is basically depicted here on the right, where you see that the concordance between automated gating and manual expert gating is excellent down to a level of one in 10,000 cells. So really, really impressive, I think. How really standardization of as much as possible, as many aspects as possible in this uh, flow cytometry uh, data acquisition process, how powerful that could be. And finally, on our own behalf, our Cytobank platform version 10 now also has an auto gating um, module, which allows you to train the module with a couple of data sets, set, uh, sets to apply exactly the same gating as you as an expert would do to this type of data sets that you have been training the algorithm on. And of course, this would reduce and take out a lot of variability. As a proof point, you might look on the left part where you see two groups of data, um, color-coded data. On the left, we see in the manual stream that four different operators, as indicated by four different colors, have uh, done a gating on, I think, more than 100 data sets where there were a lot of replicates also in there, not indicated as replicates. And there we see that these replicates um, are dated relatively consistently by the same operator. However, when we look across operators, we already see significant differences here. And if all these four operators had applied the automatic gating that was trained by an excerpt of the data before, then of course we see as expected, there's no difference anymore. So I think here is, uh, we can see really the, the full potential of this approach, eliminating variability from end to end, yeah, really from preparation of the, the sample and the acquisition on the instrument down to the analysis finally and the statistics. Yeah, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, maybe as a last comment before we come to question and answers, I would like to encourage you to visit our webpage and see the different Dura clone products that we have, as here shown in the five families with all the ingredients for immune monitoring, immune function, rare events, stem cells. So I think we have a lot to offer here, a very broad, program that could support, as I hope I could demonstrate this to you, that can support a great variety, a great broad range of different research segments. Just to wrap this up, I hope I could show that the Reclone Directive are very well standardized approaches. They are relevant, they are mentioned and referenced in a broad range of published research. and. Despite this, these are very standardized tools, you're still free 
to add markers to this. So still it's a flexible tool for you. Um, Dura clone and Durative streamline workflows. That means that we facilitate the flow cytometry protocol to be really manageable by non-experts, which is a strong prerequisite for doing multi-institutional study, studies where the skill sets between different sites clearly are variable. Not everybody can here be an expert here, but um, with this approach, they can. everybody can do it the same way. Um, simply looking at the elimination of developing an essay, of running the essay itself, of managing the inventory of single colors that you typically would have. If you look at all these aspects, I think it becomes clear that you can also save a lot of lab resources relying on this type of approach here. And of course, if you do not pipette antibodies, you cannot make an error pipetting those. So um, as we really try to reduce human intervention in the workflows um, with this type of approach, um, we are reducing the risk of human error and variability, of course. And that brings us back to what uh, we saw in the initial statement from the NIH director. Uh, we are basically setting the stage with comparable results yeah, to really ask the next question that could advance our research. Yeah, that's what I had today for you. So I'm happy to take your questions.